All right, so we are at the two o'clock hour, two o'clock central time here at Big Talk from Small Libraries. I am Krista Porter, your host here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, and this hour we are gonna hear from Leah Hamilton, who is from the Phelps Library and Steam Lab Makerspace. We just talked about makerspaces in the last hour. Um, and um, Phelps, New York, my home state. I'm originally from New York. Um, and she's gonna talk about um, their small library big partnerships that they've been um, doing at their library. So I will just hand it over to you, Leah, to take it away. Thank you very much. So according to a Chinese proverb, if your vision is for a year, plant wheat. If your vision is for 10 years, plant people trees. If your vision is for a lifetime, plant people. It's our vision at the Phelps Library to plant seeds of inspiration, curiosity, and success within our young people by providing targeted educational opportunities, particularly in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and technical skills. We aim to bridge our technical skills gap by teaching advanced manufacturing classes to eight to 12 year olds, uniting over 500 inventors, manufacturers, and makers at our annual Hands-On Finger Lakes Maker Fest, and advancing our local economy through community partnerships and education. As a public library, we partner with schools, industry leaders, community organizations, and passionate individuals because we can only be stronger working together. The library is the perfect intersection between all those who impact and influence the vitality of our communities. So a basic and broad and somewhat emotionless definition of partnership is this, an arrangement where two or more parties cooperate to advance their mutual interests. We believe it's so much more than that. So today we're gonna to explore how our small library developed partnerships to advocate for and provide education to the technical workforce of our future through innovation and collaboration and how it's transformed not only our library, but the entire perception of what small and rural libraries are and the role that they play within the community. I'll address how to assess potential partnerships from the psychological aspects to ascertaining mutual goals, to developing and nurturing the partnership, followed by examples of who we partner with, how those partnerships came to be and why. So in 2018 alone, with one full-time staff member and four part-time staff, we nurtured over 105 partnerships, regionally and internationally, from school districts to public libraries, local community members to industry leaders, and higher ed institutions and national museums. So when you're first developing a new partnership, the way in which you approach a potential partner should be mostly about them. Approaching a person or organization with a new idea is an act of communication, which means understanding the people that you're communicating with before you even start. So in order to communicate, we have to try to understand their user experience. User experience is a concept we can use to develop partnerships. So when you interact with someone, they respond with an emotion. In the beginning, do more listening than talking. Pay very close attention to everything that they say. In which direction do they want the community to grow? What is their past experience with a library, if any? What is their perspective? What's their profession, their hobbies, their priorities? What organizations do they care about or belong to? What makes their eyes light up during the meeting? Knowing a few key pieces about these individuals will help guide you in how they might respond emotionally. And you can tailor your partnership proposal with that kind of information and present it to them in a way that sparks their curiosity. So approaching a new partner is a chance for bravery. Make them feel something. Build a relationship so they develop an emotional connection to your library. Numbers and statistics and data don't do that on their own, but make sure you've done your research just in case. The development of partnerships often fall flat because people know that they're supposed to be communicating something, but they don't exactly know what they're supposed to be communicating. Your potential partner may see this as too much work, too much of a time suck, with no mutual benefit. <clears throat> they may not just see that connection. So ask yourself first, how do I want them to react and why? Why this approach? Because it's all about what happens in our human brains. There's a psychological process that our brains go through when we interact with each other for the first time. The first automatic response is visceral. This is where you never get a second chance to make a first impression comes into play. 
These first moments are your greatest chance for invoking emotion in your audience. It's where you give your presentation and your library a personality, where you establish trust, quality, appeal, and credibility. At the same time, you have absolutely no control over their emotions. They have no control in how they react. This visceral response is emotional, deep-rooted, unconscious, subjective, and automatic. That first 30 seconds is your only chance to give them a positive experience. The second is behavioral. This is a practical and functional part of their response. Here's where you lay on the accomplishments and how it directly serves the community. Does it meet their needs and requirements? It's where you demonstrate the library's alignment with the goals, hopes, and passions of your future partners. This is where you establish that they just can't live without you. So now you've come to the worst part, the reflective response, where they weigh the pros and cons of your presentation, your product, your services, your reputation. It's where they incorporate the library into their own story and cement their perception of the pleasure around it. Keep your initial meeting well-rounded so that it will appeal to all of the ways your soon-to-be partners process new information, whether they're visual, auditory, um, they like reading or writing, or they're kinesthetic learners. Prepare what you're going to say, have something on paper for them to hold and take home with them, and have an image for them to look at that represents your library, your mission, or your goal. We're forming a relationship with our audience, so be prepared to meet them where they are. So now we know how to gauge their emotional reaction. What else do we need to know to bring these partners on board with your vision, your purpose, and your mission? And even better, have them approach you for partnerships. So the first step to developing partnerships is thoroughly knowing yourself personally and professionally. What's your library's mission? What are you personally passionate about? Why do you get up and go to work in the morning? And if something's going on in the community that you want to address, why do you care? As for me, I'm not only the library director of a small rural library in the heart of, the, of New York's Finger Lakes region, but I'm also formerly a welder and I'm the daughter of a small manufacturing business owner. Our library's mission is educate, collaborate, cultivate, grow. So every partnership I develop has to fit within that mission. These kids are why I do what I do. The students who are gonna thrive in our STEAM classes are the ones who aren't succeeding in the standardized educational pathways that all kids are funneled into in public schools. They're the ones who take things apart at home simply because they wondered how they were put together. They're the ones who struggle to stay focused or who have a very short attention span or can often be found daydreaming looking out the window. They're the ones who have difficulty relating to each other. The ones who, who don't do well in black and white and right or wrong scenarios because there's no failure in making in STEM. There's only try and try again until you succeed. We try to meet students where they are. We pay attention to the kids who, for example, gravitate towards the mechanical or the digital or the environmental. And then we find partners and offer classes to address those interests. It's truly a personalized learning environment. If we can positively alter the trajectory of just one student to help them find their passion, to guide them to a life of success, however they choose to define that success, is it not worth it? So in 2013, the Phelps Library embarked on an educational maker movement. Before anyone locally knew what a maker was or what STEAM stood for or why there was a scroll saw and a drill press in the library, Every step of the way, we're growing and evolving what we offer to foster new partnerships and provide inspirational classes. We do this with only one full-time director, four part-time employees, and a $2,000 programming budget. Our STEAM initiative, as we call it, aims to meet the educational needs of our community and our workforce. The first thing you see when you walk into the library is a collaborative workspace with clean technology. So that's walk-up access to a 3D printer and scanner, virtual and augmented reality technologies, snap circuits, Lego robotics, microscopes, and circuitry sets, all the flashy stuff. But my favorite part is the dirty technology. Just past our children's room is a 1,000 square foot space dedicated to, to things where we can make messes, um, water, sawdust. Uh, the Steam Lab makerspace was the result of a grant that we won in 2013. It's available free to all ages, regardless of residency. You don't have to have a library card and it's open during all of our library hours. We're able to offer over 3000 hands-on programs per year. 
At the Phelps Library, we offer classes that give people of all ages the skills to take a hobby to the next level, if they want to start a business, for example. So back to our guide. The second step to partnership is thoroughly knowing your audience, what they value and what influences them. Speak to them in their language and address your needs in terms of their desires, and they will be able to relate to you in your library. Are they flexible and open to new ideas? For instance, our library staff enrolls in free training alongside teachers in subjects like engineering standards or the next generation science standards. And we can then use the same terminology and know what the dynamic is inside of the schools. Also find out who in the organization you should approach first, an administrator, a particular teacher or an engineer, a parent who works at a particular company. Find your in. I join groups where there isn't an obvious connection to traditional library practices, such as our Finger Lakes Advanced Manufacturers Enterprise, which is a group of manufacturers and educators whose mission is to further technical skills in our region. Know your audience and learn their language, goals, and passions, and meet them where they are. Third is knowing who is the final decision maker, the alpha, if you may, and know how others in the pack relate to them. Do they hold power of their own? What are their relationships outside of the boardroom? If the partnership doesn't make good business sense to them, then they'll have no interest in partnering. It's about knowing what they want and need and reading between the lines to find the common denominator. For example, our library has the only dissecting microscope in the entire school district. Through active listening, I learned that the middle school science teachers were struggling to teach their classes without the necessary equipment. So we want to build strong partnerships with the school, so we loaned them our microscope for the duration of their dissection labs. They in turn invited us to be a part of their middle school science fair to advocate and market our STEAM activities at the library. That led to me writing a grant for them through Rotary for $4,000 for science equipment and dissection materials. It goes back and forth and back and forth in a mutually beneficial relationship. So number four is to think about the other stakeholders in the partnership. Think of some benefit that it will have for them. If they're a parent, will it help their child directly? If they're a business, will it help them bridge something that they're struggling with? And such as, you know, a community understanding of what their business does. Will it aid, guide, or teach their future employees? Who else would be a great partner in this relationship? Address their concerns in order to win their support, which will reflect well on both of you and your, your new partners. If it's a business, what's the return on investment? If it's a nonprofit organization, what is the social impact? If it's a parent, what is the emotional or financial impact on their family? Hypothesize prior to initiating the conversation. Step five, there's a great deal of assumptions of what a library does and who works there. You can persuade your new partners to action by providing new and relevant information that they may not know about your library. When we repeat the same old message, they'll turn off their attention. So throw a wrench into the works and astonish them with something surprising, something they've never seen or heard before. What are some innovative things that you're doing at the library that relate directly to the socio-emotional, financial, or some part of the connection that you've established with your new partner? How might it be co-beneficial? Number six is knowing your goal inside and out. What's the problem you're trying to solve and why? Know exactly what it is you want them to do and suggest ways that it will be valuable to them. Be very clear about your goals so they can determine if the partnership is a good fit for both of you. Make sure it relates to the needs of your community, whether it's education, digital inclusion, or workforce development. Seven, it can be difficult to judge the communication uh, once collaborators start um, jumping on board in full force but good communication is essential for the health of any uh, relationship. Have multiple people involved if you can, who you can trust to share your partner's uh, mutual goal. For instance, I trust my STEAM coordinator implicitly to share the library's message and mission if I happen to be on vacation or out of the office. Communication means not only with your partners, but also among library staff. Also, partnership can be truly invigorating in the beginning, but what the excitement may wane once the real work begins. Be aware of this and nurture rela the relationship just as you would with any partner in your life. Finally, the last step, number eight, 
always remember your end goal. And if you're finding that you have more unfunded mandates than you do hours in the day, know when to jump ship and move on. One example where I had to say no was for the New York State Fair. I was invited to be on the advisory committee uh, for the 13-day statewide fair, um, specifically to plan a STEAM exhibit uh, as well as participate. We were one, only one of the booths, but it was really difficult for a small library with a small budget and a small staff to run a 10-hour program on a 90-degree day for 100,000 visitors. This one was easy to say, nope, I'm not doing that again. But in general, I admit, I do have difficulty saying no. So let's just say I'm really working hard to perfect this one. So as an example of partnership development, here at the Phelps Library, our goal is to develop ways and build partnerships specifically to bridge the technical skills gap. Our library works every single day to engineer and innovate solutions to this problem. I listen very closely to what's going on around me and I have a passion for connecting people who can help each other find success because we can only be stronger together. Our partners are critical to our success community leaders, volunteers, and people who participate in library events and classes. The public libraries, library systems, K-12 schools, and career and technical educators. Two and four year colleges and universities. Local organizations from the YMCA to national museums. Regional businesses and manufacturers. Our local county and state government. Most importantly, it's the students that we're trying to reach for what we do is all about helping them discover new pathways towards success and fulfillment, however they choose to define success and fulfillment. So what's our goal? We want to bridge the technical skills gap. We've been working on the emotional piece of the partnership, but we also need data to support our mission, even though data itself is never gonna change anybody's minds. So what's going on in our community? This list is not exhaustive, but as an example of how our library's partnerships directly relate to the technical skills gap, we need to know the issue so we can address the root cause rather than the symptom. So we can't find a plumber or an electrician. Manufacturers and industry leaders struggle to stay in business, not because of a lack of community need for their services, but rather because of a scarcity of job applicants with the skills required to perform the job. Workers can't pass drug tests, which is changing with the legalizing of medical and recreational marijuana in several states. Students, parents, teachers, they just don't know about opportunities for education and job training. Our culture has an ingrained perception of educational should and shouldn'ts, such as success being defined as attaining an equal or greater education than the previous generation. We push as many high school kids as we can to go to college. For so many, especially parents, there isn't any other option. These are not local issues to my library. All of these are national. So let me tell you about 127. One plus two plus seven equals 10. Research has shown that on average, for every 10 job openings, one requires a master's or higher, two require a bachelor's, and seven require technical skills. That means that only 30% of all job openings require four or more years of post-secondary education. In New York State, the Education Department reports that the percent of public and non-public high school graduates entering degree-granting institutions is 82.7%. In Nebraska, the percentage is 74%, Illinois is 76, and so on. The percentage across the United States is 69.8%, so I encourage you to check your own state's enrollment rate. For our purposes today, I'm going to use the New York data. So let's take a moment and I ask you to visualize a classroom of 100 kids. So if 83% are going to degree granting institutions, that means that 17 are going directly into the workforce or into the military or living in my basement man cave. 30 will actually be hired into jobs that require the four year degree that they have. So in New York, if 82.7% of our graduating seniors are headed to degree granting institutions to fill 30% of the job openings, that means that over 53% of our remaining students annually will be searching for work in a saturated job market, unemployable because they're overqualified and or most likely in debt. 
So how can we lead over half of our kids to a life of struggle, setting them up for additional social, financial, and economic stress? I recently asked a high school graduate why he was going to college to become a phys ed teacher. He said, because I like sports. So a phys ed teacher that I know, um, who has been working in the, the field for 30 years, he had no say whether he worked at the high school or the elementary school level, and they put him in the primary school. And there's a great deal of shoe tying, babysitting, um, wet pants changing, and dancing to the hokey pokey. There's not a lot of sports. Our high school graduates can't make informed decisions if they aren't aware of all of the pathways available to them. This is an issue nationwide. According to the Manufacturing Institute, in 2011, there were 600,000 unfilled jobs due to skills gaps. So why do we target eight to 12 year olds for our advanced manufacturing classes? Because by the time those 12 year olds hit the workforce in 2025, there will be not 2 million unfilled jobs due to skills gap as this report in 2011 says, but they've updated it. As of 2018, there will be 3 million jobs that will be unfilled due to skills gaps. At the library, we have the power to change that statistic through skills training and partnership. This report also states that our manufacturing workforce is more highly educated than ever. But what they don't state is that if that workforce is educated in their field of study, what we have are marine biologists and English and history majors working in technical positions. We also pay very close attention to reports that are issued by workforce and economic development experts, and we tailor our classes based on economic needs. So Monroe Community College, which is in Rochester, New York, has a site with national data, and I've linked to it on a web page that I set up for you. I'll tell you about that later. For instance, the skills that are needed are things like inspection. So we have projects that encourage recognizing patterns and details. Uh, repair, we take pet gadgets apart and put them back together and teach how to read technical processing manuals. Dyson, the vacuum company, has um, an engineering box. It's a free program where they'll send you a vacuum to take apart and reassemble, complete with all of the hand tools that you'll need. We teach kids and adults how to use hand tools to measure my, with micrometers and calipers. You know, there's a lot of flashy technology out there, but it's like learning a language. You can't start with conversational Spanish. You have to learn the alphabet and the numbers first. So that's why we put hand tools in their hands. These are the skills we used to learn at home, but they're being lost in the busyness and highly technological world that we live in today. So talking about our particular partners, we'd like to take a holistic approach. Our volunteers. We save so much money on our programming costs at our library thanks to community volunteers who are willing to share their time and talents with our library. All of our library classes and events are either taught by library staff who are continually encouraged to learn new skills or by talented community members. We have a local software engineer who teaches 3D printing. We have a parent who is also an engineer who has a passion for helping kids discover what they love to do. We have an entrepreneur who doesn't want to see the art of sewing lost and volunteers her time to teach our community how to use sewing machines. Gail on the left began as a student in the fiber arts in our makerspace, and she fell in love with felting. Now she has her own fiber business and she teaches many of our fiber arts classes from wet felting and needle felting to eco and salt dyeing as a donation of her time. And just as an aside, we could teach fiber arts classes from now until the end of time and our classes would be full. It's just amazing how much people are interested in those. Parents are also a wonderful partner for developing your classes through the donation of items from their manufacturing facilities that would support STEAM programs. Your local community is a treasure trove full of people who are makers, tinkerers, who love creating and learning and sharing their time and talents. Most people are willing to help, especially if you ask them directly. And where would we be without our passionate community members who embrace our mission through financial partnerships? solely through targeted donations from our community. The Phelps Library fostered the STEAM Scholarship, which is a $1,000 award presented to a graduating high school senior who has demonstrated curiosity, innovation, and creativity to empower them to pursue certification and or apprenticeship or training in a STEAM and technical skill-based career. 
So why do we give up $1,000 when we could have added it to the operating fund? It was a new type of library marketing that brings awareness to the STEAM and technical skills gap. Its purpose was to get people talking, which they did, and they put their money where their mouths are. To facilitate success for students and the library, to show that the library is a crucial educational partner. I presented the award in front of 300 people, communicating our library's mission and bringing awareness to what's happening in the community. This partnership showed us that the community supports the work that we're doing at the library. Many businesses across the country, large and small, offer free education and on-the-job training to our high school graduates. Our local ambulance company offers free training and certification for EMTs. The American multinational technology company, Corning, the glass company, has a technician pipeline program and pays a full salary of $25,000, full tuition at a two-year community college, covers all books, all fees, and once you complete your two-year degree, there's job placement. How do you say no to that? The problem is parents and teachers don't know about these opportunities and therefore kids don't know about them. So we at the Phelps Library aim to share that information in as many avenues as possible. We seek out these opportunities and advocate for them. We partner with manufacturers so that we can act as the catalyst for change to make these connections to inform students in the community about the opportunities. So I mentioned we joined FAME. Um, we've had some amazing partnerships because of this. So it's regional educators, economic development leaders, workforce planners and leaders, job seekers, and students. So FAME brings together education and industry to collaborate on relevant curriculum that is market driven by business and industry. I encourage you to seek out similar organizations in your area. It's gonna enrich any sort of STEAM program that you offer. One of the benefits to our FAME membership is the ability to offer field trips and job shadowing for our students so they can see the practical applications of what they're learning. It's up to all of us to inspire curiosity and in how the world around them goes from raw materials to the items we take for granted every single day so they can see the real world in action. Local businesses help provide us with resources and jobs for students. We had the donation of three helmets for our welding program by a local welding supply company. Another company is going to teach the welding here at the library for our community. AT&T has given us a $500 grant to further our environmental science programs. These businesses are crucial to the success of our mission. We also partner with four vocational education programs across the state and over 60 school districts offering in-school STEAM camps and providing teacher training on how to incorporate STEAM and technical skills into the curriculum, teaching them new technologies and how to set up maker spaces. We offer similar training for libraries and library systems across the state in these same areas. So at schools, we volunteer to present STEAM and technical career options. Here, we're at the middle school talking with kids on how we can use virtual reality technologies for video game design. We brought our Oculus Rift headset and Alienware computer and set it up in the school classroom. Later that day, when the school day ended, the student scramble began and the kids started showing up in the library wanting to use the VR headset. I had teachers calling me uh, because they wanted to try it. One teacher asked me how she could get students signed up for library cards. The dean of the school tried it and wants to invest in a headset to address the socio-emotional needs of the students. Um, so for simply a three hour visit to the school, this partnership has started valuable conversations, brought awareness to the community of what our library has and how we can best serve the community and transform education. For summer reading last year, I taught 21 STEAM camps to the public, in the public libraries of seven school districts over the course of six weeks. So I was at the public library and the school would deliver the kids to the library. The intention was to start a collaborative dialogue between libraries and schools, and I was more than happy to champion that cause. The curriculum I developed is also included on the website I'll give you at the end. So the greatest achievement to date, I would have to say, in our efforts to be true partners in education was with the PTEC program. So PTEC stands for Pathways in Technology. 
So kids attend high school in grades nine through 12, and at the same time, they're earning an associate's degree from a local community college in computers and technology. Part of the student assessment takes place in our library STEAM Lab makerspace. So the students come up to four times a week at two and a half, two and a half hour stretches to learn about new technologies. They are working on projects that will benefit our library and community, and at the same time, they're learning technical skills and new technologies. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship because not many people know that the PTEC program exists. So we advocate to parents and teachers. And in return, the PTEC program has linked our website, uh, linked to their website. So if you're seeking a particularly strong social impact, partner with local organizations. So we're grateful for partners like the Workforce Investment Board, and the Council on Alcoholism and Addiction. And we won a grant on adult workforce literacy and they're coming in to teach classes specifically related to this grant. Um, they're teaching public speaking. We're using virtual reality technologies to build um, the, the fear of speaking in public, to hone your interview skills, and they're gonna help with resume preparation. Um, a local thrift shop, we have a partnership with them. They're gonna be providing uh, clothing for interviews um, that they might not be able to be afford able to afford otherwise. So that's a wonderful partnership. In October of 2018, we partnered with Rochester Global Connections, which is about 45 miles away. There are these places like Rochester Global Connections at your local universities um, so I would seek those out they brought 10 educators from the country of Belarus uh, they brought them to the library so they could learn how we deliver steam and they could take those ideas back to their home country to improve their stem education and I love the thank you note that they sent it said regardless of the government efforts everything depends on each individual working at a school a museum a library and that's what we see and experience in our own country too where smaller initiatives in small towns with dedicated people can work miracles. So each and every connection that we make in our community, as they stated, can truly work miracles. I joined the STEM Hub. So this is an organization, which you probably have in some of your other states that advocates for STEM and STEAM education in schools. And I developed a partnership with the Rochester Museum and Science Center and Terra Science, who are also members of the STEM Hub. So I don't know how this happened, but together we partnered on a $2 million National Science Foundation grant, which if funded is going to allow us to study how science projects created in urban and rural makerspaces can be developed for science fairs. The Phelps Library portion of this grant is a half a million dollars. That's, I, I don't know how many times of our operating budget that is. Um, and it's gonna blow my mind if we get that. We'll find out this fall. Um, municipalities. So we partnered with our local community center and the village board to win a grant for a new playground in the village. Our library's part was to select STEM-based playground equipment and to write a press release. The grant, as you can see, by the Happy Kids was funded. And our students. We feel it's our responsibility as educators to impart knowledge and skills that will help our students make informed decisions, to develop lifelong problem solving skills and be able to get to the root of why they're making particular choices. At the Phelps Library, rather than providing the materials to complete a project and tell them to assemble it, we teach them how and why to choose these particular materials and why the materials react the way that they do. We connect them to real life experiences and they, they can use to launch their own success and fulfillment. So first is our STEM Explorers program. It's for kids who love to take things apart, who are curious about how things work, it's a fun monthly class for eight to 12 year olds taught in six month semesters where kids learn about electronics, mechanical engineering, environmental science, assembly and manufacturing tools and more. Student interests drive the class because we want them to discover what they love to do. They meet once a month on a Saturday and the kids receive their own toolkits which are donated by local engineering firms, another partner. They disassemble hair dryers and cameras and other gadgets that I've received as donations or picked up at thrift shops, and they go on field trips to manufacturers. We couldn't have a successful program without partners. 
I have an amazing, amazing co-educator here, Nick, as you can see on the screen, who is a partner and an engineer and is passionate about helping kids discover what makes them tick. Many of us walk through life taking for granted the things around us and how they came to be. Do you ever wonder where stop signs came from? Or do you simply stop at the sign and then keep on going? We took our STEM explorers to see a water jet cutter, how stop signs are made from metal so that they could look at the world around them and see how it was made. We stop and point out the details of everyday life that we take for granted. And we introduce to them the process and the tools that went into their creation. So if you need an idea for a STEM program, go into your children's room and make a list of 10 things that, you, that were created by humans and you have 10 programs that are ready to go. Find out how each of these items were made and ask the kids how they think that they were made. Teach them about the manufacturing process that you can find through YouTube videos and or visiting community members and have the kids create a replica of the craft materials you have lying around or even better yet, how they can improve on that design. We also take our STEM explorers to the local creek to ascertain the health and well-being of our local waterways through the collection of aquatic insects. A partnership with the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart and William Smith Colleges and licensed by the Department of Environmental Conservation. This partnership goes even further. The data collected by the students at the stream is entered into a database for regional scientists to use in their research. The most fulfilling partnerships are our cross-sector partnerships where we can bring together businesses, organizations, and educators. These are gonna be your most innovative and inspiring partnerships that you can create. When you bring together the minds and hearts of people with different thought processes and ideas and join them with a common goal, magic happens. So while it's a ton of work, each year I gather together 50 to 100 makers manufacturers, inventors, and people who love to build things in a one-day event called the Finger Lakes Maker Fest. We had a tornado chaser that was a partnership with a local university. Um, an aerospace company offered hands-on activities with the parts that they'd made for the SpaceX program. We saw the whole life cycle of plastics um, through the eyes of four different businesses. Every table has a hands-on activity or a steam-based experiment. Here we're painting with light, thanks to our friends at Maker Faire Rochester and the Rochester Institute of Technology. We aim to inspire others to grow and be creative and find interest in pathways that they never considered possible. This is Dan. He is a local tech teacher at the high school and he partnered with us to teach electronic soldering. Because of what we're teaching at the library, and because Dan realized the value of it after seeing it in a community setting, he decided that he's gonna add soldering back into the school curriculum. One of our presenters at the Finger Lakes Maker Fest, who was the daughter of a local sustainable plastics um, company, was so inspired by the Phelps Library's passion for STEAM and technical skills that she decided to change careers. So she returned to grad school and pursued her degree in education, and now she's a teacher. So we're in a critical phase here where mutually beneficial long-term partnerships between libraries, schools, and businesses could be developed as long as all parties are amenable to change and open to new ideas. Success is dependent on those initial contacts and measurable outcomes of those budding partnerships. So why should a library partner with manufacturers and schools and community organizations instead of simply shelving books? Why do we have scroll saws and lathes in the library? Why does a library teach welding? Because we as a society need to rethink the way things have always been done. To break down the silos of what a library or a school or a manufacturer should be or do. To inspire, to encourage. To help our young people tap into their innate creativity that is somehow lost between childhood and adulting to grow and evolve our economy and ensure the success of our businesses, to connect people to jobs that we have right here and to the unique opportunities that are out there for training, to encourage our future workforce to open their own doors and windows to success, however they choose to define that success. Because if we as a community nurture and encourage that little girl 
who may not be great at learning French, but who absolutely loves to take things apart at home just because she's curious about how it's put together or wants to create something new. Maybe one day she'll become an engineer and create new beneficial things every single day. And maybe she'll have the transformative power within her hands to make a positive difference in our community. So let's do what's never been done before. Let's tear down our silos and start talking and working with one another. Let's build empathy and find out and nurture the unique connections that we have, can develop in our communities. Together, we can help everyone in the community, individuals, businesses, organizations, educators thrive. Thank you. So I have here, um, a pre the whole presentation is going to be at that website. It's www.philpslibrary.org slash btsl. And please contact me if you have any questions about any of this. Great, thanks Leah. I saw you, I know you mentioned earlier about a web page you put together. Um, and someone actually asked, so it's great to hear. Um, so, you know, so your presentation started out a little um, more of a downer with how we're not doing so well with educating people in the right areas that we might need them for the jobs. Um, but all the partnerships and everything you've done, I think is, is just amazing that that's going to um, have a great effect on those um, jobs, hopefully. Um, so a lot of the reports and um, citations that you mentioned, are they on that website too for people, the statistics that you put out there? Yes, all of the statistics are on there. Um, I've also included some um, relevant articles, um, some specific things that we're doing here at the library, as well as multiple sites. So if you want to add more um, classes in science, technology, engineering, arts and math, some great free resources that you can use to uh, steam up your programs. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've heard a lot about that today, Steph. <laughs> It's it's getting it's it's very important, and I I think I, I agree with that. There's not a, there's so much emphasis over the years being put on getting your degree, going to college, getting that kind of education, and I think there the certain you know increase in all this maker space, and like we were talking about previously, um, what is a maker space and what is the steam and STEM. Um, is, is maybe why that is becoming a big thing is that too many people are not going to those areas and people are um, desperate for it, yearning for that kind of thing because we haven't been focusing on it enough. You know, thinking that people who are in technical fields or um, we said that the dirty uh, technologies are not seen as, as, as good, um, but there are people that want to do that. That's their thing. Right. You know, we we had a donation of a kiln to our makerspace. It was last year and we're still waiting for an electrician to come and run the 220 because he's so busy that yeah. there just aren't enough electricians out there. And yeah. some of the reports that I've read are that we're not going to know that there's actually a problem until there's nobody there to help us. And that's going to rise, the, uh, raise the costs of getting some of these people in the trades into our homes. And that's when we're finally going to address the issue. Yeah, and then it's gonna be possibly too late. Right. I'll be scrambling to catch up, yeah. <laughs> um, we do have, anyone have any, any specific questions for Leah? Type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, we got a lot of comments saying thank you for this very inspirational, great, fantastic presentation. Thank um, you. Do you have a question about um, these scholarships that you gave out to individuals? Wondering about um, the is how is that handled? Because they said in, in some areas, giving municipal or public funds um, from a public library like that to a private individual would not be allowed, would be not legal. Right. So we looked into that. And so when our Finger Lakes Maker Fest, we make it a free event and then there's a donation jar and whatever goes into the donation jar goes directly to the STEAM scholarship. None uh, of the scholarship funds come out of our operating budget at all. Um, so it's completely separate. It's entirely community donation based. It has nothing to do with library funds. All right, awesome. That's a great idea. Then it's also, um, you know, the community takes ownership of it. 
Exactly. And um, so it was a $1,000 scholarship. And that first year, last year, we raised $1,500. So it, it, it shows that the community supports what we're doing. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so now we have some questions coming in. Um, what about your library board? Were they on board with this all at once or did they need some persuading for some of the things you're doing? Oh no, they absolutely love it. I have everybody on board. Um, they're enthusiastic. They want to boost our PR committee. They want to take more action. They they want to get us on TV. And I'm like, right? I'm only one person. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, they are really championing championing the cause um, and connecting me with people that I need to meet and need to talk to. Um, so yeah, absolutely on board. I also have the full support of the village board. Um, we're an association library, we're not municipal, not school. Um, so I don't need to have the village board support, but we do rent space for them in the building and um, they love what we're doing. Great, that's very important, definitely having all of them to support you. <laughs> Hope it doesn't get too much overwhelming, you know, victim of your success type thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have another question here. What challenges did you face when trying to partner with local schools? Oh, How was that? it took forever. Uh, the oh. schools, it's like they have the deepest moats with the biggest crocodiles with giant teeth and the highest walls. And finally, you know, it's it's really things like finding out what they need and then meeting those needs. Like the dissecting microscope that I mentioned before. It's it's Rather than going straight in to the administration, um, it's going to individual teachers and, and finding out what's really going on or talking to the students. Um, and I'm still working on my own school district um, and getting and doing their professional development. But now I have school districts uh, calling me to do the their teacher professional development because they see that it's working here at our library and that it's not working in the schools. So when you have something that they don't have, you can fulfill a need. And those are the, that's the way that I approach these conversations. Um, and so far it's been really successful and it, it has required donating a lot of my time. So when we do the, um, the STEAM camps in school, um, it's, you know, it takes out a portion of my day and we do it for free. They never pay us for any professional development. Um, there is no exchanging of funds, um, but we truly wanted to be educational partners. So one thing that's happening, you know, here in New York State is that school funding is going up, but the governor wants to cut our construction aid by over 50% and cut library funding by 5%. So I'm constantly advocating for um, that we're true partners in education. And that's really why I went after the schools. And that's why I want to teach and donate my time uh, to teaching teachers, uh, just to show that we are true partners in education. I can then use this information when I'm talking to our legislators and saying, hey, look, this is what's going on. People need to know this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know we're out there, but sometimes it's convincing everyone else. <laughs> right. Part of that educational process, yeah. Uh, so um, it looks like we're having a little trouble getting to that the the link that you put there. Is it not up yet, or does it get Do you want me to type it into the the chat here. box? Um, I'll type it into the chat box here. Phelpslibrary.org slash BTSL is giving me a 404 page not found error. Okay, let me see here. Yeah. I will make sure that it is up in the next 10 minutes. I'm not sure what's going on, okay. but uh, I'll make sure that it works. Your library main page is working, no problem. Yeah, but um, oh, it came right up for me. I'm gonna type it into the, the box here so that you have it. Okay, 
I wonder if there's some sort of security on it or something, because mm. is it like um, in-house that you can get to it and it hasn't been made uh, public? Public might be something to check on later, yeah. Nope. No, it's it's published, so it should be good. Okay, okay, now they're getting to it, it says. Okay, not a problem then. All right, thank you. All sure. right. Um, all right, I think that's it for, for your session. Then. Thank you so much. That's it for okay. the questions that we had. Um, if anybody does have any questions, you know where to find Leah there. Um, so thank you so much. Like I said, that was very... Um, inspiration a lot of so many great ideas there of things to do at our at our libraries and things that we need to keep an eye on um, thank definitely. you for having me yeah thank you all right um